our two panelists this morning, Catherine Kelly and Paul Morris. Catherine Kelly is a managing director for Jamestown. In that role, she leads Jamestown's real estate services division, overseeing Jamestown's development, construction, creative, and sustainability services. With more than two decades of experience in urban infill, mixed use, and residential development, Ms. Kelly has supervised the development of more than $700 million of properties while serving in senior positions at the Landmarks Group, Post Properties, Green Street Properties, and Jamestown. In her role as president and CEO of Green Street, a subsidiary of Jamestown, she also oversees the company's green consulting practice. Kelly serves on the board of trustees at the Westminster Schools and serves on the advisory board of Atlanta Habitat for Humanity. She's Phi Beta Kappa graduate of the University of North Carolina, where she was also a Moorhead Scholar. She received a Master of Real Estate Development from Columbia University and an MBA from Harvard University. Paul Morris is the CEO of the Atlanta Beltline. It is the redevelopment of a 22-mile corridor around the central city that includes multi-purpose trails, parks, development of commercial, residential, retail, and affordable housing, as well as plans for streetcars or transit. Morris is the former Deputy Secretary of Transit for the North Carolina Department of Transportation. He's also worked for 30 years in consulting and line management roles, focusing on transportation, urban regeneration and development, natural resource management, public parks, and the development of corporate and institutional facilities throughout the United States and Canada. He has received numerous awards and recognition from groups including the State of North Carolina, the Waterfront Center, A Thousand Friends of Oregon, National League of Cities, the U.S. Department of Transportation, and the Army Corps of Engineers. Morris received his undergraduate degree in landscape architecture from the University of Oregon. And again, please help me welcome Catherine Kelly and Paul Morris. Thank you. Thank you. So we just heard three speeches about the shift in the American dream, the end of sprawl, the retrofitting of Atlanta. Your initial thoughts on what we all just heard and took in. You want to start or me? <laughs> I'll go first. Uh, it's, uh, I'll call it tidy. It's nice to be able to come out on a stage and have all of what we're working on with the Atlanta Beltline be talked about ahead of time. And this is not new. This is something that's been in the works in this region since the 1980s. And it was evident to folks that things were cracking back then, uh, but there was a lot of momentum behind what was going on, and there weren't a lot of willing voices to hear that we might need to be making a shift in our direction. So it's not for the faint of heart. This is hard work, and I think what I take away from most of what I heard this morning is uh, that what we really are desperate for in our cities is to, to live in complete communities. And all the best elements of suburbia that everyone sought when they kind of moved out beyond the fringe was really about creating a more comfortable, healthy, and bucolic experience, but not necessarily with all the other things we needed. And so now we're trying to figure out how to finish the job, put it all back together. I am in violent agreement with everything <laughs> that Lee and Paul and uh, Chris and Ellen have all said. Um, we definitely all drink the same Kool-Aid. And, um, you know, it's interesting sort of putting together their comments as well as a number of the comments from yesterday. Um, I think we have all of these wonderful demographic and psychographic trends and movements that are, that are really going to benefit Atlanta, and yet we have thinking especially from the development community, we have an obligation to really tap those trends in a way that um, really brings that value to Atlanta. And what I mean by that is we're in a position where we really need to be sure that the built environment reflects this so-called innovation economy that we're all talking about. And, um, you know, again, thinking about what we've been hearing in general at this conference, there's sort of a pattern, um, you know, in education, these silos are being broken down among the different disciplines. And when we talk about how to foster innovation, we're talking about how to uh, collaborate across different disciplines. Well, what we're seeing in the development world is, is very similar, where this sort of um, blending uh, and blurring of the lines between manufacturing and retail and office and entertainment and education, all of that is being intermixed in very 
interesting ways. Um, for example, a manufacturer or you know what might traditionally have been a manufacturer now looks very much like an office tenant. So you'd have these young people coding and um, designing on computers, printing out um, short run manufacturing or prototyping on 3D printers. Um, is that manufacturing? Is it office? You know, what is that? Um, same thing with retail where we have a tenant in New York called Amy's Bread and um, they sell bread to the customer but you can all but they also ship the bread all over the city of New York and they have these wonderful glass walls so you can take your kids and watch them making the bread and again is that entertainment is it retail is it manufacturing I think the point is um, we're seeing this sort of national trend where the, these so-called innovation companies really want urban amenity rich environments and I think that the challenge that we all have is you know how do we create the communities that really embrace that kind of tenant and customer. So talk a little bit about, you're, you both have development backgrounds, um, talk a little bit about what you're working on right now specifically and how that does help to attract and retain talent. Mm -hmm. Well, we, as you, how many of you are familiar with the Atlanta Beltline? I should have asked that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm not starting from ground zero here, am I? Uh, how many of you have been on the Atlanta Beltline? How many of you have been to the Atlanta Beltline? Yeah, see, there's people have different views of the Atlanta Beltline. And, you know, I, I come to this also from a sustainability mindset. And I, I look at it as, I like Chris's analogy or his transitional metaphor of the changing economy going from agriculture to industry to now what he terms the experience economy. And I actually think of it almost a little bit differently as the human economy, right? Where our goal is we're really empowering, we're, it's a knowledge-based economy that's driven by information and capacity of us to produce knowledge and outcomes. And so if we're going to be successful, we have to create environments which nurture people, that make them more successful. And that, to me, is a different way of thinking about the triple bottom line of sustainability in the social context. We talk about it a lot in the environmental context, and we, we sometimes struggle to understand it in the economic context. But if, if I could maybe show a couple images, if we can go to my slides, see what happens here. There we go. So you all know that this is a 22-mile uh, redevelopment. It, it's not an aging shopping mall. It's not a suburban uh, sprawling community. It's actually a lost landscape, something that started uh, and, and evolved and succeeded and then was ab largely abandoned. And it does something that's really all about enriching the human economy, and that's connecting communities and people back together. More importantly, it does all the things by design that uh, Lee and, and uh, Chris and, and um, Ellen talked about in terms of the pieces that are necessary to create the complete community. And we don't get to do one or the other I, I was joking with Aaron coming out on the stage, it's a little bit like the elephant game where everybody has a blindfold on, they're all told to touch the elephant and tell us what they see and what is it, you know, what part of it do they love? And they embrace a piece of the elephant. Somebody sees the trunk and somebody sees the legs and another person sees the tail and they all love the elephant. But at the end of the day, when they take the blindfold off, it's an elephant. And, and so we get to be, in a good way, the elephant in the room where all these things are what we want people to embrace in their own way because they meet their particular needs. And, and meeting those needs has triggered a lot of targeted, strategic, surgical investment decisions around the Atlanta Beltline that you see on the map that's on the screen. And it's not so much important that you think about what we did, but that you understand we don't get to not only do one piece of it, we don't get to do one place of it. We have to think about ways in which you create opportunity for everyone. And in that process, what we've been really th thrilled by, and this goes to Chris's point, which is, what are the returns that are being generated that are really meeting the demand and ultimately producing metrics in the economy that make sense for people? Because the economy is coming to Atlanta in a very different way, whether it be in Midtown or around the Atlanta Beltline. And the comment we now use is that the uh, recession that we all came through is over on the Atlanta Beltline, even though it may be felt in other parts of the city and region. And so we're seeing it in very <laughs> unique and different ways all over. We saw what Ellen talked about in terms of the transformative nature of our investments, and in particular, historic Fourth Ward Park, D.H. Stanton Park, and the Skate Park, all of which are very different, very uniquely 
customized and tailored to meet the economic and social needs and environmental challenges of those particular neighborhoods. And in the end, we're getting things, even through the trail corridor with the transit that's going to follow, extraordinary results. In the period that that's been in place with the hardscape condition, we're getting about 8,000 users a day. There aren't many places in Atlanta that can claim that. And on Mother's Day this last year, we saw almost 18,000 people. That's a lot of people to put in two and a half miles of 14-foot paved sidewalk or pathway. But what it says to us is that the market is voting with its feet, right? People are out there using it because they need it, they want it, and it's enriching their existence. And so much, though, that we've been able to successfully argue for this last round of TIGER grants, which is a federal USD grant program for uh, uh, programs around the country that not only contribute to their community and have regional economic significance, but that serve as trend-setting models for the nation. And to be able to be awarded not only an $18 million grant this year, but the second largest grant and one of the only grants to get our full request is really outsiders saying that Atlanta has come around and taken a new page out of the book, if you want to call it that, and not following somebody else, but setting our own path in a unique way that it is uh, singularly defining the nature and landscape of Atlanta. Going forward, there's lots more to think about, and mobility will continue to be a challenge. We heard about transportation. Uh, that isn't going to go away. We all need to be able to get around, and so when we think about what we're doing, we have to be able to get the real estate we need, put the trails, parks, transit in place, and ultimately have, even in streetscape environments that are transformed, to be truly multimodal. Places that, you know, whether you want to walk, bike, use transit, or drive, it's a accommodating of those daily needs that you have. Snapshot of the Atlanta Beltline. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> Catherine. Okay. Um, well, also, you know, just sort of in response to your question about what we're doing, um, we, as I mentioned, I guess, have this observation all over the country where our projects are located that these innovation companies really are targeting urban amenity rich um, environments and so whether it's in new york or boston here in atlanta with pont city market um, just to show an image of that project that hopefully many of you seen um, there there's some really interesting patterns and i guess what i've come to appreciate um, about how to create these kind of environments that really will attract the talent and the the innovation that I really believe will allow Atlanta to thrive um, is that we have to really work in all of these many dimensions. So it's not just creating the physical place, but it's also um, the marketing of that place. And even what we're getting into lately is the sort of mixed use tenant curation. So it sort of takes the walkable urbanism model that we've been talking about this morning and gets down into the tiny details of how do you pair locals with nationals on, on our retail curation of the tenant mix in our food hall and um, how do you mix engineers and architects and um, artists in our office space to create that sort of co-location that those companies really are looking for to inspire their own creativity. And I very much resonate with something Paul said. Our job is to help make those companies successful. And that's what they want. That's what we're hearing in all of our projects. So those are the kinds of things that they ask for, whether it's light and air or being around like-minded companies or being in dynamic food spaces that generate their own sense of community. And so uh, Ponce is, you know, that's sort of at the heart of our whole strategy behind Ponce. We're running short on time, but I do want to talk just a little bit more about transportation. You know, in the Northeast, um, it's really a part, mass transit, part of the fabric of the Northeast. You can be on a train, a hedge fund manager sitting next to somebody that works for the city. How do you get this perception, I guess, that some Atlantans have about mass transit? How do you change that? And then, in light of the failure of the Tease Blast, how do you fund it? How do we complete this? Uh, it's a complicated situation, but it's not a complicated understanding. And what I mean by that is, as, as Chris and Ellen and Lee all said, 
all of the demographics and the momentum of the marketplace are already moving in the direction that we need to be. We don't have to go find people, whether it be millennials or increasingly senior citizens, you know, mature adults kind of moving into retirement and, and beyond, who feel like they want to be able to age in place and have mobility at the same time. I often say that the first mode of transportation is our feet. And if that is not effective, then all the other modes don't meet our needs. And so we have to really make the opportunity possible for people to walk and bike and use transit at the same time that we drive. The other thing I would say is, as we think about our investment decisions, we want to make sure that we're doing it in a way that brings those basic daily needs around it as, along, as well. So it, it's not enough to have good mobility on a, on a great Atlanta Beltline and not have the, the jobs and the affordable housing and the retail services and even the restaurants and other things people need in order for that to meet their needs. So to some degree, we're having to re reform the landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's lots of market, there's lots of opportunity. We are not likely going to fundamentally change the mindsets of people, right? People are gonna do what, the, what their desires drive them to do. And so what we have to do is create, create the path of, of opportunity that meets their needs in the most convenient way. Um, what about the places, Catherine, that are, you know, not hot right now for development? How do you, you know, bring this development to these areas that are maybe under development and prevent mm -hmm. pockets, you know, in the cities of underdeveloped areas and then the hot spots where everybody wants to be? Sure. Uh, well, that's a, it's a great question. I, I guess I think about it in two ways. First, on the sort of hopeful side, I'm an Atlanta native, and having gone through more decades of Atlanta than I will admit, um, I really feel like we're reaching the tipping point where those so-called hot spots are really starting to blur together. And I think that's the trajectory we're on. Again, back to the walkable urbanism and the reversal of sprawl that we've been talking about earlier, um, that thin infilling is happening. In the meantime, um, I think one of the one of the things to focus on is is very creative marketing and sort of going to the these lesser known areas. We've had to come up with a thousand crazy ideas to create a there there, and um, and that includes everything from creating a psychological place through social media that's it's just virtual to um, a thousand crazy events. We had a um, a farm festival with a hairy man contest and all sorts of farm stands and dog events, but, but, but we found that in trying to train people to go places and create habits that they haven't had, they start to form walkability patterns and go back over and over again. Um, it also involves, um, sort of along the lines of our whole innovation track, prototyping. So it's pop-up retailers or um, short-term, temporary tenants or places or events or structures that again, start to create these new habits that hopefully are replaced by more permanent foot traffic. And I think that's what sort of starts the momentum. Any final, they're gonna give me the hook in a second. Any, <laughs> any final thoughts, and very quickly, yeah. in a minute or less, that you'd like to add? I, I would say that what, you, what we all heard this morning, and I take away from this, is there's a whole sweeping change that's afoot. And I think the mistake we might make is in thinking that one, there are complete communities even the best successes in our region, and you can think of them, are missing something that, that's necessary for it to be complete. Uh, and two, the job is never done. The, to create vital, vibrant communities and all the work that we do is a regenerative, constantly evolving decision and one we have to continually invest in. And, and I would just add briefly, I'm, I'm, I've never been more hopeful and optimistic about our city. I, I see all the ingredients here, all of the movements of demographics and trends, and we just have to capture that opportunity. Feels good to hear you guys say yeah. that. All right, thank you so much thank to you. Catherine and Paul. And thank you guys for joining us.